Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Beyond's panel discussion on ways to make your business thrive in a down economy. I'm Lori Wiggins, CEO of Beyond. Beyond enables technology and software companies to transform and grow faster than their competition by building a bold and actionable growth strategy. Special thanks to Make Offices for hosting us today. And now I'd like to introduce the panel briefly and they will each provide a brief description of their experience and background. To my left, I have Hector Del Castillo, uh, Chief of Product for Beyond. Next to him, we have Jody Ruth, CEO of Redstones. Next to her, we have um, Frank Olschlager, partner at 10 Mile Square Technologies. And last, Max Krasinovsky, CEO of Moss Creative. So starting with you, Max, why don't you give us a brief overview of your experience and your company, what, what it does. Sure, thank you, Larry. Uh, MOS Creative is a creative tech and digital agency. Uh, we help clients build digital products such as web mobile applications, uh, design experience such as user experience, user interface, uh, video animation, uh, and brand identity. Uh, we help them fix code and also run digital marketing campaigns. Thank you. Uh, Frank Olschlager. Uh, so today, technology is a critical differentiator for the ability of companies to compete. Whether you're a pure play technology company uh, or an industry company that relies on technology uh, to do what you do. Uh, at 10 Mile Square, uh, we help you realize the ability to leverage that technology for competitive advantage. Thanks, Lori. Redstones is the opportunity partner for growth companies. We work on uh, growing long-term value and increasing cash flows. Personally, my background, I've spent decades with major international um, airlines and telecoms and AOL. Spending time doing customer lifetime value analysis, billions of dollars of M&A deals, and billions of dollars of debt and equity raises. And then when I founded this company in 2003, the intent was to bring that same focus on building long-term value and cash flow. We partner with our uh, clients to do that today. Thanks, Jody. Great. And hi, I'm Hector Del Castillo, Chief Product Officer at Beyond. Only 8% of companies excel at both strategy and execution. And why is that an issue? Is because companies that don't excel at both today struggle to grow and get positive growth. Today's discussion is gonna be focusing specifically on those things that we help clients to understand, not only what is the right growth strategies to have, but also how to execute on those strategies. And I'm looking forward to today's discussion. Thanks, Hector. So now we're going to start the panel discussion. I have a question that I'd like each panelist to answer. And that is, what is the one thing that you want the audience to take away from this discussion and add any stories or experiences to back up your assertion? How about you, Hector? So the first thing is I want to talk about seven different things that you can do to actually get positive growth and actually figure out how to allow your company to not just survive during an economic downturn, but also actually grow faster than your competition. And we're gonna be talking about specifically some of these things uh, in, in today's discussion. What are some of these ways and what are some of these things that you can do to act now if you're a business owner to actually get fast growth with your company and be able to outperform your competition? Thank you, Jody. Yes, uh, the message that I'd like everyone to take is to act swiftly, kick on every day. I see this as a time where there's opportunity coming. And um, act swiftly. Uh, if, we, if we take those three components and, and delve into them a little bit, act swiftly uh, means being uh, thoughtful uh, and deliberate but then acting decisively, you can always make a change later on. 
Uh, kick on is an equestrian term. Some people know I ride. Uh, kick on doesn't mean gallop blindly with your eyes closed. Kick on means uh, be controlled, be focused forward, and have power and momentum. So when you're galloping down to that four foot fence, you know you can easily clear it. You're not just galloping, flailing blindly where you're gonna be toast when you come to that fence. And the reason that I say every day is, it's critical that you not wait till a major economic event or a major event that impacts your business to take these concepts that you'll hear from all of our panelists today. Uh, that's why I say every day. And let me just elaborate on that if I will. Um, you know, I started my career and, and was in the entrepreneurial space and saw how entrepreneurial companies, entrepreneurial companies would struggle at moments, whether internal factors or external economic factors impacted them. Um, when I then uh, began at the larger companies, the major international companies, I saw the same things happening. And it is this um, factor that I really want to I hope everybody um, takes away today. And I'll just give one example, and this was really an eye-opener for me. Um, a major international company uh, thought we were gonna make $500 million in March of the year, uh, but by the end of the year, we lost $500 million. And that was a billion dollar swing. And I can remember sitting with the leadership team, and they're smart people, been in the business for decades, and I'm like, oh, it can't get, you know, we're off a little bit from our March numbers. It can't get much worse than that. Then by June, we thought, oh, maybe it'll be break even. Well, they lost $500 million. And so that was a wake up call for me that these factors affect companies of all sizes. And the fundamental principles of act swiftly, kick on every day, apply across industries and across, across company sizes. Thanks, Jody. Mm -hmm. Frank? Yeah. So um, actually, you know, I, I agree with what you're saying. And um, what I would say, I think, kind of riffs on that point, which is, you know, you've got to go into uh, any environment, any economic condition prepared. Uh, and, and you've got to plan for it. And the time to act uh, is not after uh, after the fact, you know, once you realize that you're in the middle of that situation, uh, the time to act is, is before you get there. And there's a couple of really good examples um, in recent memory uh, that I think, you know, a lot of people can relate to, right? You know, there's 2008, uh, which was just a, a horrendous, uh, you know, time uh, in the technology industry. Um, you know, there was, uh, after 9-11, uh, you know, a lot of industries just stopped. Um, and, you know, if you go back a little bit further, you know, we had the dot-com boom uh, with the simultaneous, uh, you know, telecom meltdown. And and 9-11 you know, wasn't really predictable, but you know, these other two things were. And you know, if you're monitoring the environment and you're preparing for you know, the good times and the bad, uh, then you're gonna be in a really good position to come out on the other side, not only whole, but stronger as a company and a lot stronger than everybody else who didn't prepare. And, and so that's my one takeaway is be prepared and come out stronger. Yeah, I definitely have to agree with Frank. Be prepared is always the key. Uh, I also would recommend entrepreneurs uh, or even just big companies that are either building a product or starting a service approach it with design thinking mindset. Test it first from the audience or if you already have clients from your clients to see if they would like it. If they will like it and the proof concept and you have buy-in, then build a product or expand your services. Uh, it's the best way to it's so the best way to um, start any type of product or an additional service. Thank you. Our next question is, and I'll direct this to each one of you in turn, as economic conditions change, how should companies adjust their strategies going forward in these areas? Frank, what about the area of technology? 
So in technology, uh, you know, there's a lot of things uh, that, that one can do. And especially as you're coming into preparing for an economic downturn or a recession or, you know, really any kind of change in the market uh, that takes you off your footing a little bit, um, there's a, a number of really good opportunities. And uh, contrary to what, you know, might be the, you know, sort of obvious uh, thing to do, uh, it's actually a time to be bold. Uh, it's not a time to, to contract. Uh, and you know, kind of hunker down because you know this is this is actually a playing field of opportunity. So there's you know a couple of different aspects to this. You know, one is that uh, we have all these really wonderful ways of doing automation with technology now um, that frees up your knowledge workers to do really much higher value higher value things uh, than we used to be able to do. And you know, investing in that sort of stuff. Uh, is a really, really good investment because it makes your entire organization um, able to operate more efficiently even when the times are good. Uh, and you know, that'll give you an advantage. In tight times, when you need to be able to operate more efficiently just to get through, you're gonna be in a really good place to do that. Uh, a less obvious one is actually going for the brass ring and doing one of those digital transformation projects that you've been thinking about for a while because now is a point in time where you can actually change the market dynamics and jump out uh, to the front of the pack uh, in whatever industry you're in uh, by leveraging you know, these kinds of capabilities that are out there. Thank you. Hector? How would you change your strategy in the area of operations? What would you tell your client? So in operations, I think it's really critical. Um, we talk about that most companies think of themselves, you know, in simplified ways. You know, there's marketing, their sales, and then the operations. And I'd like to break it down into each one of those areas really has to be broken down into the people as well as the processes and then the systems and tools that they are actually using. Mm -hmm. So from an operations point of view, the first thing you want to do is you want to do two things. Number one is you want to reduce your cost structures mostly by what Frank mentioned, invest in technologies, new technologies, new tools, new systems that actually allow you to automate and you do more with the same amount of people that you have today. Yes. Do that throughout your operations. And sometimes the struggle is in most companies, they don't divide operations enough into the se segments that are that create a lot of value for the company. From supply chain management to manufacturing to the actual design and development of, and every, all the teams involved. You want to make sure that at least all the tools and systems are being adopted throughout the entire organization. And that you're looking for opportunities to automate as much as possible across all the critical areas that are part of your operations. So the first thing is identify those things and then cost reduce. Second thing you want to do is, is then move on to the marketing and sales, which is about revenue streams. And then you want to be able to automate supporting that if you wanted to scale uh, how much you're selling when you're getting maybe five times, 10 times the uh, actual demand of where you're at. How is it that you're going to scale and deliver and still continue to uh, support all those new customers in a way that uh, doesn't, doesn't take more people automatically? So those are the things that you want to create as, as looking from an operations point of view, not just what is it that you're doing as far as like uh, you can reduce your cost structures, but also what is it can you can do to actually enable new revenue streams to actually start growing the top line and also then uh, growing the bottom line as well. Thanks, Hector. Max, what would you suggest in the area of marketing that a company adjusts as far as their strategy going forward with economic changing economic conditions? So I also think that there's the company should pay attention to uh, a new type of clients that might open up for them in terms of change. Uh, they should look at different channels that they can use to communicate to those people. So obviously the first step is really identifying, okay, is are we still serving the same type of audience? If the market change has affected the, the target audience they were serving, the personas they were serving, they have to change. That's something they have to evaluate first. From there, they have to evaluate what channels are they using. And one of the best examples that I can, I can refer to right now is, uh, for example, I said everybody knows about search engine optimization, everybody spends a whole bunch of money and time on it, but one of the best things, for example, for our company specifically that has helped us a lot to grow our business has been by focusing on directories that are relevant to our audience, right? Mm -hmm. Which are entrepreneurs or startups or growing companies, um, 
it gives us an incredible advantage not to spend all the time in months to try to get to the top, but by creating the right type of, of profiles on those directors, getting the right type of uh, uh, referrals from the clients gives us an upper hand on other companies that might just have a profile, but at the same time, it gives us a higher ranking automatically on Google, on uh, Yahoo. I'm also going to refer to Google because that's a bigger search engine. So really understanding the dynamic shift from the target audience that, you, that, you're, that you're servicing, should you start servicing a new type of offering, again, mm-hmm. finding that market product fit, right, or service market fit, yeah. which is huge, which a lot of times people don't really think about it. They fall in love with the product, they fall in love with the service, and that's all they want to hang on to. But you have to adjust. Times will adjust, you have to adjust. So that's some of the initial things that I would really refer to. Thank you. Jody, what would you advise in the area of finance? Um, and uh, thanks, Lori. Some of my answers will be similar to what others have said. Mm-hmm. But the first thing I'll start off with is uh, make sure you have a really active, strong financial planning and analysis function, an FP&A function, whether that's one person or a whole team. That team will be the into the uh, will be the insight into um, where there is opportunity in your organization, um, which leads to my second point. Engage the people in your company, not just your finance team, yes. but across. Mm-hmm. And the finance team can help translate the need into a language that others can understand. Uh, in other words, why do we have to do things differently? Oh, well, we can save $20 million if we do it differently. Um, so engage the, uh, the all of the people in the company. They will make this happen for you. Um, and the third thing, would be to, uh, and this just repeats what Hector and uh, Frank had said, be willing to do things differently uh, with less, but achieve more. So you should be viewing this as an opportunity, not as um, a, something to fear. Um, and then the strict finance things, optimize your borrowing capacity, um, put into place any potential uh, debt that you can, um, also do any sale of assets, anything that you're not using, um, anything that you don't actually have to have, do a sale lease back. There is always a way to monetize any asset that you have. It came out of our transportation. We can monetize anything. Um, so use this opportunity, and you should be doing this every day, not just when you think there could be an economic downturn coming. Mm-hmm. Great. Right. Thanks. Thanks. Good answers. So this next question is intended to be answered from a tactical point of view. Kind of the quick things that you can do as far as the three most important things business owners should do quickly. And um, uh, Max, as far as their brand awareness, what are those three things they can do rapidly to help themselves? Is this specifically in a downturn economy or just all the time or any time? Um, as long as it's applicable to a uh, time of changing economic conditions. Gotcha. Okay. Um, well, something really quick that entrepreneurs can do or companies can do is um, creating content like we're doing now. Um, you can definitely be assured that I'm going to be using this content in terms of uh, my own posting my own social media sites. But um, one really cool, easy tactic that I've heard from others that I think is genius, we try to only just organize speaking engagements or events where we can record specific content, but really smart uh, marketers actually use even just regular meetings or presentations, not specifically in front of a big crowd, just to record and cut specific parts of it to use in LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever is the right social media um, source for you. Uh, so that's that's one of the quickest things. Um, speaking engagements is also very, very good to build credibility. Um, it's a lot easier to come out to speak in front of the right audience and obviously get a lot more people come after the event to try to speak to you. And you said three? Is that three of them or? Three. Okay. Um, Let's come back to the third one. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. That's great. Uh, the Jenny? marketing guy setting the hook. <laughs> what would you advise as far as increasing their cash flow? Uh, Very quickly. Yeah. So uh, three items. The first item, 
understand your value drivers and where you can shift the lever to get more value. And I'm going to give an example. Um, uh, in wireless, um, we needed to make some changes. Um, we did a root cause analysis on our churn, which is the customers leaving. Uh, and our most valuable customers were the business class customers, as you can imagine. And so we found they were leaving because we were not solving their issue. When they called customer care, we didn't fix it on the first call. Mm -hmm. And so I can remember the day, we, we, we had a cross-functional team uh, investigating this, and I can remember the day I walked into the room where they, where they presented me with their findings, and they said, we need to create a business class call center never heard of before, right? A business class call center. We're going to have experienced call center people. We're going to change the way we compensate them so it's not on how many calls they do, but they are not allowed to get off the phone until they've resolved the issue. They have a direct access to the best of the technical support team, and they solve the problem. And if they need to give some credits or do whatever, I thought it was brilliant. And I can remember the team said, Oh, we're so glad you like it. We're going to go down and do the, you know, the capital analysis. And I said, oh, no, 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 no. We go implement. Act swiftly. We go implement this. The minute we implemented that, we actually, our business class churn stopped. So when you talk about the biggest impact to your business, that is enormous. We delighted our customers. And the beauty is we delighted our customers. And this differentiated us from our competitors. And because our churn stopped, our uh, profitability and cash flow increased. Sure. Um, and if you want to learn more things like this, uh, text to 66866 millions. That's 66866 millions, and we'll send you a link uh, that you can use our, we have a, an assessment tool that will give you a value that will highlight where in your specific company you can find these types of opportunities. Uh, uh, two more things. Uh, the first is a plain finance item. Collect your receivables faster. I hear people say, oh, they're fine. Well, if you can shave a day or two or three, that makes a big deal. Stop the leakage is my third item. How many of you have a business development person that has really not hit their targets for the last 18 months, but they may, but when you look at their pipeline, it's not a real robust pipeline. Um, the fancy office space you got when you did that acquisition 18 months ago, that you have you know three people in and they have parties in the afternoon mm -hmm. subtly set off the space mm -hmm. make these smart decisions and if you're doing these things now it'll make an enormous impact uh, in your financial cash reserves and your long-term value great thanks hector what about from the point of view of increasing customer base so I would say that the first thing you want to do is retain your current customers at all costs. And mm -hmm. it, as, as uh, Jody uh, um, mentioned, you want to eliminate any customer churn, and that's your number one metric. But often, if you want to outperform competition, just customer retention alone is not going to be enough to leapfrog or outperform your competition. So you need to focus now on acquisition strategies for new customers. And as Max pointed out earlier, content can actually drive a lot of new buyers or new prospects if you know how to target and use things like video marketing quite effectively. However, you also need to make sure that you are looking at implementing your marketing and sales channels so that you, your funnel can go through from marketing, leads, and all the people that are now aware of you to people who are now comparing what you're offering compared to somebody else to the point where you're actually going to be driving sales and start focusing on reducing your sales cycle when you're selling into the same type of customers that you already have. So you can actually use a lot of the, your own customer data and start segmenting it 
and know that if you're look, uh, actually selling to specific segments, what is that sales cycle? Because it's actually going to vary by segment. Once you find that information, you, acquisition means you need you will keep them at the same or if not shorter than that, and that's how you can actually start fine tuning whether you're doing the right marketing, whether you have the right sales activities, and there's usually content throughout the entire process, content on, when you're marketing, content when you're selling, and content even in actual retaining and keeping your best customers around. So you want to make sure that you're focusing on the strategies up front, and then it's almost like you're looking at the organization upside down, because as opposed to you looking at the operation side, you're looking at it from the customer's point of view, and you're looking to maximize the value that you're delivering, and it's perceived value from the customers that you're selling into, not what your stakeholders or your executives believe is the value chain within your company. Get that perspective and then focus on maximizing the value being delivered and then be able to then monetize. Over time, as you're retaining and acquiring customer segments across, you should be able to not only grow the top line, but also become more profitable, especially when you're relying on a lot of the things that you're leveraging on from your operations to continue to reduce your cost structures. Thanks, Hector. Um, Frank, three tactical things to strengthen a company's technological advantage. So I'm going to cheat a little bit. Uh, I'm going to cheat by backing off of uh, what Jody and, and Hector had to say, uh, but also because I have four things. Uh, okay. Although, slide. Uh, you know, I'm stealing yours. You know. uh, <laughs> but, the, you know, the four things are, are actually really um, conceptually very simple, right? Um, and that's assess, act, measure, and improve, right? And this is basically where you've got to break it down to. So I'm, I'm stealing your assess because, I mean, that's really, you've got to understand where you are. What is your ground truth today? Absolutely. Because if you don't know what that is, then you're just making random changes. I don't care how strategic, you know, the plan is. If you don't know where you are today, it's a random change. So you've got to start mm -hmm. with, with the baseline, the ground truth. And, you know, much like in psychology, you know, it's very difficult for us to understand our Ourselves. You know, so you know, my partner Stephanie will be the first one to tell you that she you know she knows my my emotional state like days before I do, right? <laughs> um, and then I'll come around to it. And I'll be like, oh yeah, you know, you're right. I was kind of feeling like that. Um, it's the same in a business, right? You're inside of it, so you can't really tell what's going. You don't have that. You're 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 married to yourself, so yep. it's really good to get an outside look to you know have somebody come in and run an assessment uh, that is an expert in whatever area it is that you're trying to assess. And, you know, coming into a time of economic change, especially in a recession, you really want to look for where are the weak points in the business model today and in the operation. Totally. From a technology perspective, you know, you want to look across the value chain, um, you know, uh, the life cycle of your value creation, right? You know, where do the ideas come from? How do they get implemented? You know, how are they operated? Are we doing any of that, you know, really efficiently, not efficiently? Is anything broken? Do this value all pile up and stop somewhere? Where, you know, waiting at some kind of uh, you know local bottleneck um, that needs to be addressed. You know, these are these are all things that you want to do, and then you got to act on that, right? You know, as as Jody said, you know, don't go do the capital improvement plan and analysis going to take six months because six months later it's too late. You've missed the you've missed the boat. It's left. You know, bye. Um, so you've got to act, and that's why the next thing is really important. You have to measure, right? So is that thing that we acted on? Are we acting in the right way? Are we doing are we improving it? In, in your case, you guys hit it out of the park, and you, and you just you stopped you know customer churn in its tracks, and, and that's awesome because that's what you want. It, you know, it, when you expand that out to all possible things that you can do, the first thing that you do is probably not going to be the thing that gets you all the way there. So you have to measure the results of what it's doing, and then be willing to be honest and say, you know what, we only got it sixty percent. We've learned this, so we're going to change direction a little bit. We're going to come. You know, so I grew up sailing. We're going to come five degrees to port, and you know we're going to go that way a little bit, you know, and we're going to adjust and, and keep measuring, right? So then you get into that, you know, um, measure, measure, improve, measure, improve, measure, improve. Oh, that sounds like continuous improvement, doesn't it? Um, and that's really where you want to go. And yeah. here's the magic thing about that is if you get that into your culture, then that becomes part of your culture, and you're doing this all the time. And boy, you're just going to be unstoppable regardless of economic conditions. 
Boy, I, I can, could not agree more. And I just want to emphasize a point, um, a thread that I've heard through each one of your answers, and that is understanding where you're at now in terms of your industry and your competition to really benchmark your competition so that you can evaluate yourself and understand how and where you need to improve. Great discussion. Lori, I'm ready for my third one. You're ready for your third one. Go for but it. Just, uh, I agree with all your points. Customer uh, churn, obviously, if you keep your customers for a lot longer, it's a lot less expensive to acquire, to, to keep your current customers than acquire new ones. Obviously, if you have data to look at, it's a lot more helpful, right? Because you're able to uh, uh, look at something else that if it's working, if it's not working, wants to be realigned. But another really simple thing is, depending on the size of the company, but also the way that you communicate with your customers, we've found out ourselves, for example, one of the most effective ways, especially for new customers, talking about bringing uh, or acquiring new customers, has been text message. So even though we drive traffic from online sources, once they convert whatever that means, either online through directories or uh, our lead generation forms, the follow-up is usually through text message is a lot more effective of how we're able to get them to buy in. And that builds trust. So trust, especially in a good economy, especially in a bad economy, is a lot more important, right? So if you have that trust, an easy way to communicate, and you'll be surprised how many times that you're from potential customers, oh, you know what, you guys are so easy to talk to or to reach. I can't even reach the other development or marketing agency. Yeah. I'm like, aren't we in the communication business? I mean, this is our you know top core values. So that would be my third. Okay, cool. thank you. Next question, and um, I'll open this up to anyone or all who want to answer. How would you advise a prospective buyer in these changing economic conditions from your professional perspective? What would you advise them to do if they're hunting for an acquisition? I'll start. Uh, the first thing you should have is a strategic acquisition plan. Know what you're looking for. Yeah. Uh, know what you want to get out of it. Know where your boundaries are. Uh, is it a new technology that you want to acquire? Is it new, uh, a new customer segment you want to acquire? Do you want to just in, uh, expand the customer segment you already have? There are no right or wrong answers, but you just uh, it will it will vary depending on your particular facts and circumstances, and you should be very clear on what you're going for. Uh, it's very distressing when you hear somebody come up and say, "Oh, my neighbor," or the you know at soccer on Saturday, you know this guy tells me he wants to sell his company, and I think maybe we should buy it. Well, why? Uh, you should understand what your why is, and that includes what you're going to be willing to pay and how you're going to structure that deal, and understand what the true cost of that deal is, that includes a year and two out when you have to start releasing people and paying severance. Um, uh, and also then make sure you're prepared for the integration synergies to take longer because they're always going to be integration synergies. And then finally, you know, be aggressive, put a lot of deals out there, make a lot of offers, and uh, walk away from any that, that, that you can't close. But be aggressive on those offers and put a lot out there. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to, to add on, on to, I agree with, with, with everything you said. Um, and I think especially when you come into a recession, it's a really, really good time to go value shopping, right? So if Absolutely. you know what your strategic acquisition plan is, then you know, you've already got your short list of 10 or 15 companies that you know you would maybe like to own someday. Well, guess what? Now is the time to go out there and start those start those conversations. Absolutely. Um, I would say, you know, one sort of special caution that I would throw into the whole uh, M&A game, uh, you know, when you're in the middle of, of a recession, is that, you know, even if you've done all the things and you're planned and, and you're in a strong position, you can go out and do that. Uh, acquisitions are resource intensive in, endeavors. Uh, they, you know, um, and Jody's going to slap me for this, but it's like buying a horse. 
Um, you know, it's not the course the cost of the horse that's going to eat you alive. It's owning the horse for the for the next ten years um, that's going to get you. So you really got to make sure that you know um, what the economics of what you're buying are. You know, how efficient of an operation are they? Um, how different is their culture from yours? Because if you buy a company and there are you know eighty percent of the employees are like I'm out, you know, there, there's a lot of value that just walked out the door right there. So you've really got to take a closer look. Not that you wouldn't look at these things anyway, but you know when you're you're being progressive in a time when other people might be tightening their belts, you've really got to look a little deeper into these things and make sure that you have a plan for how you're going to make that successful on the other end of the deal. Amen. Yes, Matt. Yeah, I'd like to add as well. Uh, be creative with your deals and with the offerings. It doesn't always have to be monetary. It can also be partnership. It can also be if the other potential partner can uh, uh, have value from you adding to their service or to, to their team or otherwise. Uh, I've acquired before and I've also tried to partner with a company as well. Uh, we The good thing about it, we have additional office space and so we brought him in as, as a sublease tenant and uh, later on we figured out that we're not really meant for each other. So date before you marry each other, um, the best way to describe it, but definitely go through that experience because that, that can be a very long process afterwards. Yeah. Indeed. I have something to add as well. I, I think that if you're not prepared and you don't have a strategy and then the way you execute, you're going to miss a lot of the great opportunities. In, in, a, in a market, it, it tends to become really more of a, of a um, buyer's market, and it's really the well-prepared buyers that actually are prepared to look, they're looking at the right targets, looking at when is the right time to acquire, and all the different reasons as to why those are great acquisitions. So that they can start structuring uh, the conversation in a way that uh, starts really estimating and forecasting the total cost of ownership of everything from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. And there's so many things that can go wrong as far as not estimating effectively your cost of you know technology integration, systems integration. You know, even as you're not even in the due diligence process, but at least understand all the things that are going to be major cost structures needed to. Uh, you really get the merger integration right. Absolutely. If you're not prepared, you're going to miss those opportunities because M&A opportunities, especially the great ones, if, if they have a very narrow time of, of opportunity yeah. for you to act. If you are you know, not making a decision, you're not decisive enough to make the offer at the right time, you're going to miss them because they're going to go to somebody else and usually that'll be your competitors that are now getting that benefit of, of, of having those conversations. So typically, I, I, I quote um, you know, companies like Marriott, for example, that um, you know, it, uh, it was uh, the largest hotel chain Chain, actually headquartered here in Bethesda, and we're the biggest chain for a while until Airbnb started uh, coming into market mm -hmm. and then quickly disrupting the entire uh, hotel marketplace. Well, for the long time, Marriott and both Hilton, who are headquartered here, have actually been doing a lot of acquisitions together. Yeah. But it, they were basically losing market share against you know much younger companies like Airbnb and others that are also in a new hotel chains. Well, the opportunity arose when uh, Starwood uh, was actually now looking for, for a buyer, when uh, completely unexpected. It was the CEO of Marriott that made the decision, look, it's something that was not in our queue, but this is one of these opportunities that don't come every year. As a matter of fact, we don't see this kind of opportunities in, in you know, maybe every 10, 10, 15 years, that's when they come. So it's usually decades, if you miss that window opportunity, you miss it. And act, luckily, Marriott was in a, in a good position because they had already been doing that, that uh, four-step process that Frank spoke about, and they were very prepared and when, as soon as they heard that Starwood was, was actually available and uh, for sale, they started looking at how to do the financing, how to do the integration and all that. And the rest is history because now Marriott is, is the number one hotel chain now that they're in the process of integrating all the Starwood holdings. And that's something to be said because that's actually locations around the world. They were both global brands. A lot, a lot of, of, of activities going on around the world to get the merger integration right and then make sure that they continue to monetize and become more profitable over time.
Great. Um, Frank, one quick example um, to illustrate your point again. Um, in 2008, uh, Stanley, the tool maker, had its eye on several acquisitions. They had already done their cost cutting. They, had, they were cash rich. They were ready to acquire. In 2009, Black & Decker was doing very poorly. Black & Decker, who for decades was synonymous with power tools, and they would had their eye on them. They were able to pick them up at a bargain, and um, Stanley Black & Decker is still going strong today. All right, next question. How do you tell the difference between buying a company at a good price, a good value, and buying a cheap company that is no bargain? So I'll open that up to whoever wants to answer. I think I can take that one. Okay. So first of all, it, you know, there are some acquisitions that you're trying to do because we, as a company, what you're really bottom line is if you want to become more profitable, you want to increase and diversify your entire customer base across segments when you're selling into uh, uh, across different types of seg segments. So you're looking at some acquisitions that allow you to expand because you're actually diversifying your customer base. Mm -hmm. And the di diversification means that you're not overly dependent on one set of customers. You're actually now uh, have a different group of customers and you have a good leverage so that if you lose one, one group, it's not going to be a large portion of your revenue or your profitability. This is, uh, you know, examples of this is, is, is when what you want to do is you want to start looking at how profitable you, uh, the segments that you're selling into are when you're comparing to each other, and then how do you say that you're going to diversify to be able to do that? So uh, the the next approach is to figure out when, because the market or demand is actually consolidating or decreasing, declining quite a bit, mm -hmm. you might need to acquire just to consolidate. That means consolidation means you're acquiring the other company to so to retain the actual customers that they're that are buying from them instead of you. And and now it's because you're actually seeing that you have the entire industry has excess capacity, some cost, you and your competitors, and demand is declining, you want to make sure that at least you're consolidating to decrease that excess capacity that exists within your industry to try to get that, you know, back to, to closer to where it's favorable to you as a vendor. Thank you, Hector. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to throw in there, I think, you know, value is in the eye of the beholder. Yes. Uh, there, you know, you can have, uh, you know, two companies that, you know, look at a target for acquisition. And, you know, one might be looking at it and saying, you know, we're, we're doing accretive acquisitions. And they look at it and they were like, yeah, you know, the revenue's not really there. We don't see the growth and stuff like that. The other company might be looking at it as, you know, they've got this interesting piece of technology that when bolted onto ours would really allow us to enter a new market, right? So for them, it's, it's, a, tech, it's a strategic acquisition um, that allows them to do new things. So, you know, both of those companies are going to come up with very different uh, M&A models uh, in terms of what the value of that company is to them. So, you know, I think it's very easy um, for a company uh, to, to look like a cheap, uh, you know, poor value uh, uh, investment uh, to any number of possible acquirers, while somebody else can come at it from a completely different angle and say, you know what, we're, we're you know, they're going to get a 5x five, 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 five exit on that because that's really important to what we're doing. And, um, you know, so I think it's a, a little dangerous to make over, over general generalization about how a company is particularly valued. Sure. May, may I add one thing yes. before we go? And, uh, you know, the, the points are well made already. Um, and But I have one very, very basic point I would like to make. When you're doing your due diligence, um, pay attention to the results of the due diligence and your advisors and your team. Uh, because, you know, if it's the big strategic acquisition, great example, Marianne Hilton, um, I've done those kinds of deals myself. You're doing that deal and you know you have the resources to deal with the fallout because there's going to be fallout. But those are not the average acquisition. Um, pay attention to the deal. And never let yourself get in the position that we have to do this deal to survive unless it's a big strategic acquisition. Because I see more often than not, people ignore information they had and then end up paying too much 
or buying something um, and they lose the value and they lose the value because mm -hmm. and it's not because they didn't have the data but they didn't pay attention to it you know can you can you get a customer list if they can't give you a customer list you should probably walk away and I've, I've had somebody buy a company like that um, if the technology is old um, and you know the former owner uh, is still around and won't give the keys to the server and you don't have it written down I, what do you do so these are examples of some real life situations where uh, acquirers have chosen to move forward and the headaches have been enormous as mm -hmm. a result so it's a simple issue that, that's a really 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 good point yeah. um, and, and you know it's interesting when uh, my company we, we do a, a couple dozen uh, technology focused due diligence exercises uh, every year uh, across the whole spectrum and I've had you know since we deliver these reports they're usually about 30 pages long or something like that we insist uh, on doing a either a video conference on the phone or even in person if we can get it uh, sort of report review and, and you know delivery uh, yeah. with whoever our stakeholder is mm -hmm. and I've had more than one GP or m and lead um, you know at the end of that phone call go you know, gosh, I, I didn't really, you know, see, you know, the importance of that. You know, it's like we bolded in the report, right? But they're like, you know, they, they didn't see exactly what that meant to them. And they're like, you know, we're going to use that and, um, you know, change the, the deal. And, you know, I've had them call back later and say, hey, you know, we shaved $10 million off the deal because of that one exactly. call you gave us, right? Yes. Um, a couple times, unfortunately, that's also scuttled a couple potential deals. And I always feel bad for the sellers in, in that point. But, you know. The seller didn't hire us. Um. <laughs> Better to avoid the bad deal. Right. Uh, yeah, I want to that's a classic. That's a classic point. Avoid the bad deals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. All deals are not good deals. No. Right. Not at all. One hundred percent. So, Frank, you, you, I think you hit the nail on the head. Uh, really defines what you want to get out of the deal. So, really defining it initially. If you're trying to get a technology, if you like. The customer base of the, of the company, if you like the team, um, you, I mean, it's very rarely that you like everything that's involved in the package. I guess it also depends on the size of the package that you're going after, but really checking the doing your due diligence in terms of what you're trying to acquire if it's technology doing the due diligence technology so when we actually brought in an investor for one of the companies I was involved in he wanted to do a full uh, audit of uh, the software that we built just to make sure does it make sense to rebuild it even though he was already in or does it make sense to continue using what we already had right mm -hmm. um, talking to customers really understanding you know are the customers happy because you might be buying and it's all uh, you know bluff and then afterwards it just all falls through so really understanding but then it kind of goes into your point uh, Hector is if you're taking too long are you gonna miss that opportunity right <laughs> but you also have to have good attorneys because sometimes attorneys can be uh, uh, deal killers as I like to call them yeah. don't tell any attorney friends um, so just got to be creative and know exactly with how you're approaching the deal I think we're gonna cut that out if you're right. gonna be deal killers <laughs> 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 I can hear the phone ringing lawsuit already. <laughs> I don't name any, you just said it, you know. Uh, next question. So, uh, I'm going to turn it on its head and ask you about advising a prospective seller. In these changing conditions, from your professional perspective, perspective quickly, how would you advise them? Oh, I'd like to take the first run at that because sure. uh, we actually do that, um, uh, from, again, from the products and, and technology uh, and operations point of view pretty, pretty regularly. Um, and this comes from, um, you know, decades of having, you know, built and sold companies and, you know, bought some stuff along the way and things like that. And so what we tell sellers is, uh, you know, have your stuff in order when the seller comes to the table. Amen. If you can hand them a, a three ring binder with you know organized little tabs that lays out every aspect of your organization, they're gonna look at that and they're gonna say, okay, these guys know what they're doing. And you know, you, 
you may or you may not, but you know, you basically put yourself in the position of credibility with these folks when you're that organized. And you know, it's a little bit of a psychological game, but they're not going to dig as hard as a result. And so you've given yourself an advantage in the deal simply by having your stuff in order, being prepared, and handing them effectively uh, a diligence book um, that gives them 80, if, if not 100% of what they would have asked for anyway. I'll bring to that. Um, it's a sales process. It doesn't matter if you're selling a product or a service or a company, right? Yeah. If you're prepared and you answer the questions they might have before they even ask you, like being prepared with a, uh, with a binder, it will be a lot easier and smoother process. So I agree to that. Yeah, and I want to add that um, often that takes work because it's like it becomes a living document. You may not have a an updated business plan, but you do have a final record of the company and everything that the company has done. And that's part of your preparation is to make sure that you're updating documentation about your entire company from operations to marketing and sales so that you can actually start creating all these documents and all the contracts that you have, especially when, when they're uh, multi-year contracts with suppliers or even with distribution channels. You want to be able to have all of that information prepared and just be aware that there's a lot of documentation that usually any buyer will request even before there is any due diligence and the more prepared you are and the more organized that you have it packaged it's part of packaging your company and staging it for a prospective buyer at some point to to buy the company mm -hmm. and the more uh, detail oriented you are and maybe even get a team of people to help you put, put this together the more that you're going to find it actually will help you uh, and, and you can even uh, go further start attracting the right prospective buyers because now that you have clarity that, uh, who, where, wh what kind of companies would see the value in buying your entire company, you're now targeting them from a marketing point of view, which is basically the marketing and sales funnel for your entire company. Mm -hmm. So that's that's what I would say is you've got to treat it in such a way that you're creating a marketing and sales funnel where you're going after and marketing to prospective buyers that see a lot of value in buying your company based on who they are and what they do and what they're trying to achieve in the marketplace. Your understanding of, if you do a little bit of research, you'll find likely uh, buyers where if, they, if you get an offer from them, they'll buy you up. Right. Entire companies that have actually done that because from the very inception when they formed, they already had in mind who was gonna uh, buy them out. You know, and many of them are, are these uh, modern applications like WhatsApp from the very beginning. You know, within three years after they got nothing but users, very little revenue, they were already from the very beginning uh, ready to be bought out by Facebook. And right. that was a multi-billion dollar sale when uh, WhatsApp didn't have anywhere that, that, that type of revenue. Same thing for uh, you know other things like uh, Skype and, and the acquisition of Skype by Microsoft. Those are all the ones that things you guys start looking at. How do you prepare that marketing and sales channel so that you can start targeting and then targeting the right prospective buyers for your entire company? Thank you. Um, so uh, go ahead. Yes. May I, may I add? Yes. So um, my co-panelists talked very tactically, and uh, their comments were dead on. Um, but if we take it up a level, back to the uh, act swiftly, kick on every day, there's some things that you can be thinking about, and, and this information applies on the other side, on the, on the buy side. Um, Companies with return, recurring revenue get offers that are almost double the multiple than companies without. Amen. Companies with monopoly in their market get 50% higher offers. Mm -hmm. yes. So there's a great example. Um, it's, a, it's a company kind of in, in my space. They do uh, payroll. They only do payroll for nannies. They don't do payroll for cleaning crews. They don't do payroll for the handyman. They only do nanny payroll. Mm -hmm because they were so specialized and they had such a high net promoter score of 78%, which is unheard of, uh, they made an enormous multiple for a company that sounds so simple. Um, the net promoter score, the average is 10 to 15%. Hard to believe uh, that's what the average is. 
target your company to be at 50% or higher, your multiples are going to go through the roof. Um, um, reduce your reliance on a single customer. Here's a key for the growth, uh, the middle market. Reduce reliance on a single employee. Are you caught in the owner's trap? If your customers know your name, you're caught in the owner's trap, and you will get a reduced multiple as a result of that. Mm. If you have built a business that's strong enough to operate where your customers don't know your name, uh, you will actually get a little higher multiple than average. Mm -hmm. So that is the owner's trap, a very real factor in um, middle market and growth companies. Mm -hmm. Reduce reliance on a single supplier. We talked about supply chain, mm -hmm. and um, this was your example. The WhatsApp loved it. Uh, leave some field to plow. Um, how easy would it be to accommodate five times demand? Mm -hmm. If it is hard, obviously you don't get a higher multiple, um, but if it's possible, easy, you still get a decreased multiple. The only time you get an above average multiple if it is very, very easy. And in fact, this can help you decide when it's the right time to sell your company back. Mm -hmm. I have a similar example uh, to the one Hector gave, but you, you know, the example I had, which was Airmail, they only had two customers and they went to the big player and they got uh, an enormous cash deal uh, at an enormous multiple because the strategic buyer understood that they had a huge field to plow. Mm -hmm. So while you can't change all of these things all at once, um, you can assess where you can get the most bang for your buck. And if you can pick one or two of these things and be aware that you've done that and the increase in value you bring, you'll better position your company in any type of environment. Boy, I agree with that. It's really all about maximizing your value maximizing before value. you get into the M&A deal. Right. Yeah, and that ease of scalability that you talked about is a very real thing. Every PE based due diligence we've done, the number one question the PE firm has had is scale. how easy is it going to be for this organization to scale? Yes. Yep. Um, that's what they care about. Yes. Amen. So we have some questions from the audience. Um, and uh, the first one being is, um, when, if I have a company, when should I start preparing my company for a recession? When is a good time to do that? On the day you started. Okay. Agreed. Uh, I think that you want to start as early as, as, as possible and you want to make sure that at least you're tracking, you know, what is the current situation in your industry and with your competition and then look at the entire business ecosystem and start looking at, you know, what are the what if scenarios that when, when there's good times and then when there's bad times. And that means that from the very beginning, not only are you working on evaluating and, and, and really enunciating your business model, but you're also working on a lot of modeling, financial modeling of good good scenarios, bad scenarios, and hope that you know the reality is somewhere in the middle of that, because that's what usually will happen. If you're not looking at worst case situations, you're not going to be prepared. It's almost like you, you know, now you're in the middle of a hurricane and you don't have an emergency preparedness plan. Well, you should have had the plan to begin with, so you can now, you know, and practice it so that when the disaster does occur, you now know exactly, and everybody in the company knows exactly what to do and when and then the sequence of things. You not only do you have to have the plan in place, but now you have to get everyone on board to start practicing on an ongoing basis when you see opportunities to do the emergency drill, so to speak. Mm -hmm. and, and part of it is that you want to start doing this and, and make it part of your practice because, as Frank mentioned earlier, it's part of your continuous improvement of the entire company. That not only do you know where you want to get, you know, where you want to go from the very beginning three to five years from now, but now you're looking at all the what-if scenarios that allow you to start de-risking and building a company that, is, that becomes more and more resilient to, to bad risk when, when it happens. Yes. You know, it's interesting because in, in IT, you know, for decades now, it's been, you know, expected that IT have a disaster recovery plan or a business continuity plan, right? You know, my server blows up, yeah. how am I going to do business, right? Yes. And that's just expected. 
yet you don't find that same practice in other areas of the business. You know, what happens in a reception, you know, recession, you know, when our customers freeze our budgets. So, you know, I, I had this company um, in the 2000s and 2008 came and, you know, we saw massive global companies that were in our sales pipeline, like, you know, some of them days away from signing contracts, you know, con story, you know, true story, um, contract officer for a global public company called up our VP of sales in I know, like May 2008 and said, um, you know, we were getting ready to sign this kind It's like a $5 million deal for our company. And we were an, we were an ARR, uh, recurring revenue based company. Um, and he called up our VP of sales and he said, my entire IT budget has just been frozen. We will not be closing this deal. And I can't tell you when we're going to get authority to spend again. Right. Yeah. And then 2008 just proceeded like that. You know, it was a really, really tough year. And, you know, I remember our sales organization um, was kind of like, what do we do? Right. And, you know, it, that's that's not a fun place to be. So, yeah. it's, you know, really all aspects of the organization, you know, have to plan for these things. Um, right. So, it's, you know, I think Andy Grove, right, said only the paranoid survive. Um, <laughs> you know, so it's kind of that mentality. Unfortunately, you've got to be in there. The, I, I can't attribute this, but the, the other sort of pithy quote is, um, aim for success, plan for failure, right? Um, I don't know who said that, um, but uh, hopefully it wasn't anybody bad. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, that, but they were right. Mentality, right. I'd like to answer that as well. Uh, somebody told me once a really cool quote that stuck with me. Um, this person does business with the economy, not the people. So if you understand how the economy moves and you're, first of all, if you're waiting for that to hit, then you're too late, yeah. right? Uh, but I also think it's very different. If you're a smaller organization, you can be a lot more agile. If you're a big organization, obviously there's a lot more things you have to shift. Um, but at the same time, you should be agile, agile you know? Um, so um, you just really have to, uh, I'd love to hear also your thoughts in terms of like how you guys prepare from the experience, because we've all been through this experience, doesn't matter, small or big company, uh, we've probably all those deals or deals were frozen or didn't move forward, whatever it was. I'd love to hear from a bigger organization how you guys actually are planning for next recession, if there is one, take it another time. Yeah. Totally. Yes. I think that'll take longer than my uh, yeah. one minute. Long. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> I would think. You know, as as uh, we have this discussion, you know, making sure you have substantial cash reserves is a very basic item. If you've done all your act swiftly, kick on every day, um, and and done the assessments my co-panelists have outlined, um, you'll be in a good place. You know. You might normally have three months cash, maybe you want six or nine months cash reserve. Mm -hmm. Because because we don't have to hit a global recession. Uh, there can be a, a major client of yours who uh, has financial difficulties and goes bankrupt and just simply doesn't pay you. Mm -hmm. That's why it's so important to do um, a lot of this work every day and not just wait for a potential uh, global economic situation. Oh, down. <laughs> right. Uh, and 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 um, so you know somebody maybe Warren Buffett cash is king. Make sure you have those cash reserves mm -hmm. on hand. That'll give you flexibility um, um, in these times uh, because things like that will happen. Yeah. Just to summarize, uh, disaster planning is imperative, and having the financial reserves to weather a problem. And uh, down economies are simply another scenario that you have to plan for and prepare for. Another question from the audience is, what can happen to my business if I don't prepare before the recession? Just where we insert the sound effect of a <laughs> <laughs> Can I start off on that? Sure. I'll, I'll just share some uh, real life experiences. Uh, those lenders that you thought were real friendly to you, they wanted your business and they loved you and you've never defaulted and they're always wanting to bring you a new deal, they may decide to cut your line of credit off. 
and not let you borrow more. Mm -hmm. So they may have things going on their side. So, so I share this as an example. Don't assume your lenders are always going to continue to love you uh, because of that, that's a very real situation that has happened. Uh, a lot of lenders um, uh, in, the, in the past, in 2008 timeframe, they cut off people who had never been late. They had 20 and 30 year relationships with companies. They had never missed a payment, uh, great credit, and they cut off, cut them off. They therefore couldn't uh, pay their suppliers. They lost credit terms, and it just is a spiral down. I know, it's hard to believe, but these are things you don't really anticipate, mm -hmm. but they are a reality. So have more than one lender. Don't only have one lender. So I'm going to um, ask the panel to wrap up its comments quickly as uh, our time approaches. So anyone else who would like to go? So what I would like to, to say is, number one, be prepared and have and ensure that you are continuously identifying strategy to execution gaps. And that role really means that you use your business model and your operational model for your company to understand how do you actually close those gaps to make sure that you're prepared. Uh, the, the other one is that depending on, on the situation, be prepared to do worst case scenario and make sure that you continue to do a lot of risk management and have your plan ready whenever it is that you need to start doing, working the what if scenarios to start looking for what, whatever it is that, that your company is next for your company because it should be very clear that as soon as you get into the situation, you know exactly what are the steps to actually start doing some of the things that you don't control when there's so many, so many things out there that can actually uh, you know devalue what you're doing in the marketplace so you want to make, make sure that you're doing that and continuously measuring and then readjusting as needed to, to have that loop of feedback going from assessment all the way to measure and then readjust as needed you know sometimes you need to pivot significantly in the marketplace what your business is doing and you need to make sure that you have clarity as to what is the best way to pivot your, your entire business Thank you, Hector, and thank you, everyone. What a great discussion that we've had today. Max, Frank, Jody, Hector. We're going to close now. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today for our panel. And feel free to contact myself or Hector or any of the panelists. Have a great day, whatever you're doing. This concludes our discussion.